Hello, this is Mike McKay. I'm a partner at KNL Gates Law Firm in Seattle. I'm here with Aaron Milstein, who's also a partner with our firm. Thanks so much for joining us today. But we're going to take a few minutes to talk about staying in civil cases when there is a parallel criminal investigation or prosecution. Aaron, most civil litigators don't have to address criminal issues, but sometimes a collision of the civil and criminal worlds cannot be avoided. For instance, you may represent an investor in a civil lawsuit against his financial advisor. When you find out during discovery, he may have been operating a Ponzi scheme. You then find out the government is investigating the financial advisor and understand criminal charges might be forthcoming. Alternatively, you may represent an executive who has been sued by his former employer for an alleged improper use of company funds. Worse, you find out the government is conducting a criminal investigation of your client for these expenditures. That's right, Mike. When a party in civil litigation in either federal or state court faces criminal exposure, the dynamics in that civil case can change significantly. The party facing criminal exposure must consider whether what he does in the civil action will be used against him in a criminal case. In contrast, the opposing party may seek to press an advantage to force his opponent to fight a legal battle on two fronts. And if you represent a client in civil litigation who's under criminal investigation for related conduct, or if you represent a client suing someone for criminal misconduct, you must be prepared to navigate these issues that will likely be generated by the parallel criminal matter. So this is what we're going to talk about today. When a party in a civil case is facing criminal exposure arising from the same general conduct, he could request a stay of the civil litigation until the criminal matter is resolved. But stays are not guaranteed. We will examine factors courts generally consider and provide considerations for the thoughtful litigator, regardless of whether he represents the party seeking a stay or opposing one. In picking up on that, in a criminal case, an individual defendant has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And absent a stay in the civil case, a party who also faces criminal charges must either invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege during discovery, which could result in an adverse inference against him in the civil case, or waive his Fifth Amendment privilege, which could significantly impair his defense of the criminal charges. A civil stay avoids this Hobson's choice by allowing a litigant to focus on his criminal case first. But if your plaintiff's counsel and you don't want your case sidelined for months, if not years, because your adverse party is under criminal investigation, we recommend you stay tuned. You no, know, the U.S. Constitution does not require a stay of civil proceedings pending the outcome of criminal proceedings. Whether to stay civil litigation because of a criminal prosecution is discretionary with the court, and it depends in a significant way on the unique facts of each particular case. The starting point, of course, is for the court to examine the extent to which that defendant's Fifth Amendment rights are implicated. In addition, the court will consider other factors, including the plaintiff's interest in moving his civil case along and any prejudice caused by the delay. Another factor is the burden that's placed on the defendant caused by the civil proceedings. Please review our article on the KNL Gates website to see a complete list of the factors, as well as case citations for your reference and convenience. A link to that piece is embedded in the podcast description that you've just opened up. Courts apply these factors on a case-by-case -case basis, but there are a few general factors courts review when deciding whether to grant a stay. The court will first consider the implications of the Fifth Amendment right and resulting burdens on the defendant. Accordingly, a defendant that's seeking a stay should emphasize the factual similarity between the criminal proceedings and the civil proceedings. If the underlying facts in the criminal case are quite similar to the civil litigation, the chances for a civil stay will increase considerably, and you don't need a criminal complaint or indictment to obtain the stay of a civil case. An act of criminal investigation can be enough to bring a motion to stay, because the right to assert one's privilege against self-incrimination does not depend upon the likelihood, but upon the possibility of a prosecution. A plaintiff opposing a stay should emphasize any dissimilarity between the criminal and civil cases. In addition, the plaintiff should consider whether the defendant has already waived his or her Fifth Amendment privilege, for instance, in his answer to the complaint or discovery response or other similar filing. The courts will consider plaintiff's interests in proceeding with his civil case. Plaintiffs will normally argue that they have a strong interest in favor of an expeditious resolution of their civil case, regardless of the potential prejudice to the defendant. Important to this factor is whether evidence will become lost or stale, or whether resolution of a criminal case will actually aid the plaintiff's civil action. It is important to consider whether the criminal charges have been filed or if they're merely a possibility. 
A stay when criminal charges are only a possibility places a larger burden on the plaintiff because the stay may last many months, if not years. However, granting a stay may actually reduce the burden on the civil plaintiff. It is possible that a resolution of a pending criminal case could benefit a plaintiff if the plaintiff is also the victim in the criminal case. Staying a civil case early and allowing the criminal case to proceed could narrow the issues and streamline discovery in the civil proceeding. Collateral estoppel based on findings in the criminal case may also expedite resolution of the civil case. These developments might actually benefit a plaintiff in the civil case by reducing the plaintiff's burden of proof and his litigation costs. Whether you represent the party requesting a stay or opposing a stay, there are additional considerations to keep in mind. If you represent a plaintiff about to file a complaint against multiple defendants, consider crafting the case without reliance on any statements from the party facing the criminal proceedings. Or if you believe a court's likely to grant a stay, seek to limit the terms of the order in either scope or duration. It's entirely possible a court will stay discovery only as to particular defendants on particular issues that are facing criminal charges, likely to face criminal charges or have the potential to give rise to criminal charges. And so you want the stay to be as narrow as possible. In this vein, a stay does not have to last until the criminal case is over. A court may stay the civil case and require a status conference at regular intervals to reassess whether it should remain in place. Staying a civil case is just one consideration when a parallel criminal matter is underway, but it's an important one. Whether you represent a plaintiff or a defendant in civil litigation, it is important to understand how a court will review a request to stay civil proceedings and how they will apply the multi-factor test. Understanding these factors and the various arguments parties can raise is critical to guide the court to the correct decision. Thanks for listening. If you want more details, please read our article, which goes into this in more depth and provides citations for your reference. You will find a link to that article embedded in the podcast description. 